All right, good morning, everybody. My name's Eric Ryan. I'm Vice President of Communications here at NASCAR. Thank you for being here with us in lovely Phoenix, as well as those joining on the live stream and on Sirius XM as we prepare to open this historic 75th anniversary championship weekend. I'm here with NASCAR President Steve Phelps and Chief Operating Officer Steve O'Donnell for our annual State of the Sport. We'll begin with a brief address from both gentlemen, and we'll start with you, Steve. Thank you, Eric. Um, it's good that this is working. Uh, first of all, um, welcome to Phoenix. It's great to have you all here. Uh, as we typically do, want to take a moment and thank our media corps um, for all you do for our great sport. Whether this is your 38th weekend or your first, each of you play a role in bringing our sport closer to our race fans. So I want to thank you for all you do. Um, secondly, before we get into this weekend and the season overall, I did want to take a moment to congratulate Kevin, Har Kevin Harvick on his amazing career uh, and Eric Amarola. We're super excited to uh, have Kevin in the booth next year. Um, not exactly sure what Eric's plans are, but um, I'm sure we'll see him around a racetrack somewhere. This is the, uh, the fourth year that we've been in Phoenix for our championship. I think this community has embraced uh, our championship. Um, if you think about what happened from a, from a fan perspective, uh, we've been sold out of the, the race on Sunday uh, since June. Um, early sellouts uh, last year and the year before as well. So it's great to be in Phoenix, but also the local community, what the local community has done for our sport. When you walk off the airplane here and you see the city of Phoenix and the pageantry and the displays and whatnot that, that they have, uh, despite it being a, a World Series market, um, we feel welcome here. Um, and we also feel welcome by the corporate community. So uh, a big shout out to Latasha Kazi, who's been here a little over a year. I think Latasha and her entire team have done a spectacular job in making sure that this facility uh, looks like it does, which is spectacular. Uh, and we're looking forward to crowning three champions on their national series um, with our Craftsman Truck Series, our Xfinity Series, and obviously our Cup Series on Sunday. Um, so 75th anniversary season. I think it has been an extraordinary season on a lot of different levels. I promised Steve that I would not steal all of his portions on the competition side, which he is going to speak to. But I think the, um, the competition itself has been, as it was last year, extraordinary. Um, and I think it really is a testament to, to the next gen car. Um, and I won't get into a lot further of that because uh, Steve will handle that. Um, you know, I, I think about this championship and you think about our racing. So when we cr crown our champion on Sunday, and we'll talk specifically about Cup right now, we're going to have a, a playoff system that I believe is the toughest in sports. And if you think about the style of racing that we have and the, and the incredible competition on the racetrack, think about the variety that our, our drivers had to go through, right? They raced on dirt. They raced on concrete. They raced on asphalt. They raced on short tracks, street courses, road courses, super speedways. Is there another racing series on the planet that can say that? I don't think there is. I think we've got the best racing in the world, and I think it's the most competitive racing in the world. And when we crown that champion on Sunday, that champion is going to be very deserving. And I've heard some things that were people was like, hey, listen, this is gimmicky. and when it, It's not. It's an incredible, incredible playoff system that rewards the best drivers in our sport. Uh, as I think about the 70th anniversary as well, I think um, in kind of a moment of reflection around what are the key objectives or the key metrics that we have. Um, I talked about competition briefly. Uh, I would also go to attendance. So I talked about sellouts here. Um, had 50% more sellouts this year than we had last year. I think everyone who goes to the racetrack can agree that not only do the crowds look better, and they do, but the energy level coming to a NASCAR race is as, as good as it's been in, in a decade. Um, 
it is our goal to continue to have growth in attendance at all of our racetracks. Uh, other would be consumption. So if you look at digital and social consumption for NASCAR for this year, it's up. Um, television has been a bit of a mixed bag with the cup being down, low single digits, as well as uh, our Craftsman Truck Series, low single digits, um, and then the Xfinity Series being up. I would say that we haven't had great luck, particularly in the first half with weather. Weather wasn't our friend, um, but I'm super excited to get us back on the growth pattern from a television perspective uh, next year because we'll have lower comps than we did this year. So excited about that. I think that NBC came back in a, in a powerful way um, and those metrics being up. So if you consider back in March, we were down 15%. And now we're down middle, mid single digits. We're, we're happy with where that, that is. Um, one thing I want to talk to uh, right up front, um, and I'm sure there may or may not be a question on this, is where we stand with our media rights. Um, our media rights, uh, the amount of interest in attaining our media rights for 25 and beyond. Uh, exceeded our expectations. Um, it is our expectation that not only having a great result with the CW, uh, with our Xfinity series, um, and what's gonna be an incredible 33 race schedule on broad broadcast television, we believe that we're gonna have a very strong result with media partners that will look at a combination of broadcast, cable, and streaming to some degree. What that looks like, I don't know. Are we getting towards the end of this process? We are. Um, did I think that we would have uh, a result earlier? I did, um, but we haven't. It's an incredibly competitive marketplace. But with that said, I wanna assure all our race fans, um, anyone who's listening, and certainly the media core here, we have had tremendous interest uh, in our sport from a media rights standpoint. Uh, the next one I want to talk to is uh, charters. Um, I'm not going to get into the negotiation, so, but I will give you kind of where we are um, to the degree that I can without getting into too much specificity. Um, if you would ask the race teams, do we think we're making progress with, with NASCAR on where things stand and the extension of our charters? I think our race teams would say yes. Um, we understand that race teams want three things. And I'll talk about charters specifically or cups specifically, but honestly, it's the same thing for Xfinity and, and, and trucks. So if you think about um, race teams, what do they want? They want to be competitive on the racetrack. They want to make sure they're break even or, profit or profitable, right? And as it relates to the charter specifically, they want to increase their enterprise value. So I won't get into numbers about where we stand from an enterprise value standpoint with our charters, but I would say this, um, when the charters change hands um, at the end of the year, and we know at least one will, um, there'll be a significant multiple um, that race teams will have from a, from a charter uh, enterprise value standpoint. Um, and again, as I said, Xfinity and trucks, want the same thing, right? They want to make sure that they are competitive on the racetrack and that there's an opportunity to, to seek profitability. Um, I think that goes into what will be my last area, which is industry collaboration. On a lot of different fronts, and Steve can talk to this, the, the collaboration with our industry has never been better. Whether you're talking about OEs, you're talking about racetracks, you're talking about uh, teams or you're talking about drivers, there is, a, there is an energy level, an excitement level that we are moving together as one. If we're gonna optimize the growth of this sport, we need to continue to do that in 24 and 25 and beyond. And we are putting plans in place to make sure that we do that. So charter extensions, in addition to having um, fast race cars coming to the racetrack to be competitive, we, may, we need to make sure our race teams are helping to grow the sport. We need to do the same thing from, from a driver perspective. What things can we put in place that allow us to be most successful 
um, with the drivers and having the drivers help promote the sport to agree that they um, they're that that they're not doing today um, and we think there's room there um, and then as it relates to the racetracks to make sure our racetracks are also doing putting their best foot forward whether the racetracks that we own or Speedway Motorsports or Independence and the collaboration there has also ne never been better can we do better we can and we will and lastly um, I wanted to, before I turn over to Steve O'Donnell, acknowledge Steve um, and Steve's leadership for this sport. Um, Steve currently oversees competition strategy and innovation, uh, our racetracks, International, um, recently uh, have announced that Steve will add some responsibilities in the areas of sales, marketing, content, digital, social, I had to miss something here, so I'm going to broadcast. So um, Steve's title won't be changing, but his responsibilities are changing, and I'm super excited uh, to have Steve um, uh, take those additional roles. And the last thing I would say, just so I can embarrass Steve, today is Steve's birthday. So please be nice to Steve when you ask questions. <laughs> Over to you. Thank you, sir. Um, and, and I would echo what, what Steve said, that the time and energy not lost on us, you know, how many races we have through all of our portfolio of races. I saw some of you even over in France, you know, covering Garage 56 and Le Mans, huge effort. Um, but all that has really been helpful for the sport. So thank you. I would, would echo what, what Steve said as well. And I'm going to be brief because we've got a championship coming up and uh, really cool to see the ladder system. We've got uh, Sean Hingarani, 17-year-old with a shot at an ARCA championship today, um, which is really cool. Um, Joey Danowitz in the back who uh, has come on board to help us really work on that ladder system uh, with youth racing. It's going to be huge for us as we look at, you know, how someone gets into racing, um, how they go up through the ladder system, clean that up a little bit, but a huge focus for us going forward. So appreciate Joey coming on board and, and looking at that. Um, and then also want to give some credit. Steve talked about the collaboration, and we've got what I think is the most trust in the garage area that we've ever had, and, and that's a testament to both John Probst and Elton Sawyer, um, Tom Bryant here as well. Uh, the only way we get better is by collaborating with the industry, and they've got to have the trust of our leadership to be able to come to them, whether it be rules packages, safety initiatives, whatever that is, uh, to be able to work together. And I think there's an understanding that we are not only always going to get things right, um, but we're open-minded, we're going to look at things, and we're going to react quickly where we need to. And, and I believe you're seeing that. So if, if you look at the second year on the cup side of our next-gen car um, and where we are today, if you look at last year to this year, what did we want to see? Clearly a focus on safety, wanted to make improvements there, um, and wanted to see continued excellence on the racetrack in terms of the number of drivers that are able to win and probably even more importantly the number of organizations that we're going out and, and going to be able to compete and not have a fluke win but really compete for race wins race in and race out and you're seeing 2311 you're seeing Roush Racing, Trackhouse, um, JTG go out there and, and really have a shot to compete. Um, we saw 15 different winners 10 of the 16 organizations won a race this year um, that's incredible. Um, the OEMs have all been represented. All three OEMs are in our final four. So going back to Steve's point, uh, you got to win and you got to perform on the racetrack. All of our OEMs know that three of the four had to win um, the most wins uh, for the season, second most wins for the season, tied for third most wins in the season for our four championship contenders. So a lot of quality throughout the year that built up through the championship. So we're really proud of what we've seen on the racetrack. Um, and the results that we've seen as well. Are there some things we're going to continue to look at? Absolutely. Short track, road courses, um, you've seen some improvements um, that we've looked at. Not exactly where we want to be, but Goodyear and our partnerships worked really well. Uh, the drivers will be meeting with Goodyear today, I believe John said it, at 5.30 to continue to work together on the race and the rules package around our short tracks and road courses. A lot of different things we're gonna look at both from an efficiency standpoint for the race teams and then what you see on track as far as quality of racing, but certainly like the momentum we're seeing. Uh, really important that we saw what we did at, at Martinsville, competitive race, uh, and that's the momentum we wanna continue to build on. And then probably the last piece I wanna address is you know, a lot of questions last year, rightly so, on, on the safety aspects of the car. 
and the work by Dr. John Padillac and the teams uh, together collectively talking about what we've learned, what we could do, and quickly reacting to new parts and pieces on that car, the front and the rear clip. We had two really, really severe incidents this year, um, and that car held up. Um, and we were able to learn from that, and as I've said and will repeatedly say, and I think everyone on our team will say, it's an endless journey for us. We want to be at the forefront of safety. We're going to continue to learn. Um, when we find something, we're going to implement it and react. So proud of the group and the effort, and I think most proud of all four championships here and the quality of drivers we have, not only in the ARCA West Series, but you look at trucks, you look at Xfinity and Cup, Really exciting group of drivers coming up, both young and some seasoned veterans, but the future's really bright when we look at the, the ability um, that these teams have um, and the momentum that they're bringing to the sport, not only for our championship, but, but for years beyond. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Eric. All right. Thank you, birthday boy. All right. So we will take your questions. Just remind everybody, try to keep it to one question. Also say your name and your outlet. All right. So we'll start with Jordan Bianchi. Jordan Bianchi, The Athletic. Uh, question about charter negotiations, and I got a quick follow-up. Um, when you look at the deal, when ideally would you like to see a deal completed by uh, with the teams? Well, I think the first thing we need to do is get through our media rights, uh, Jordan. And I think the race teams have seen that. With that said, we're currently having discussions with our race teams. So. We had a meeting last Wednesday with a, a team owner council where the entirety of the meeting was about charters um, and charter extensions. And, you know, we've acknowledged that we want to change the paradigm for our race teams. Um, and we need to make sure our race teams are profitable. We need to make sure our race teams are competing on the racetracks. And we are interested in having their enterprise value climb, as I had said earlier. So no timeline, um, but we are, as we're f finalizing our media rights, we are talking about other portions of what our charters would look like that are not financial. One of the sticking points uh, up during the negotiations is uh, about the length of the contract that would be with the teams. The teams have said they would like it in perpetuity. My understanding is that NASCAR maybe is not in favor of that. So is NASCAR okay with teams having franchises you know, forever? Or would you like to see a cap on that? And then if not, why would you want to see a cap on that? So we're, we won't get into the negotiations specifically, Jordan, but I would say that I'm confident that the teams in NASCAR will come to an agreement that's going to be fair for race teams, fair for NASCAR, and help grow the sport. And I think that's what we're going to do. All right, next we'll go to Bob and then to Dustin. Uh, Bob Pockers, Fox Sports. And talking about the short track and road courses, you've tried a lot of things. One thing that you haven't tried is to increase horsepower, yet that is what dri money drivers often say needs to be done, and it sounds like the, some, at least some of the engine builders are open to it. So is that under consideration at all, and why or why not? I think everything's up for, for consideration, Bob, and, and we've proven that. Um, you got to factor in, you know, what are the costs involved as well, right? It's, it's not as simple as just up in the horsepower. You, you better be ready for all your OEs to be on board. Uh, it better make sense for any potential new OEM and new technology, um, and it's not just a short-term answer. So for us, I think, you know, we're going to look at shifting um, specifically around that at our next test and see what we can do. So um, there'll be variations. There'll also be some arrow things we do with the underbody. I think there's some some things we found in Richmond um, from an arrow standpoint that could work as well. So um, nothing to report, Bob, in terms of yes, we're going to do that, but open everything. But I would say short term, more around shifting and, and the arrow package. Okay, Dustin. D Dustin Long, NBC Sports. Um, you guys have talked a lot about interest internationally and wanting to go internationally, and there was a lot of talk about going to Montreal this year, other than for next year. Why is NASCAR not going to, to Montreal next year, and when is it likely that is that opportunity still open, or what, what does the future, what, what does 2025 look like internationally? Yeah, I think um, 2025 and, and really beyond um, look – like there's a number of opportunities. So when we looked at Montreal, absolutely there was there was interest um, on both sides. And I wanted to dispel kind of some of the, the rumors that were out there that Iowa came in in place of Montreal. It's not the case. Um, in an ideal world, we actually wanted to potentially bring on both both racetracks. 
And I think when you look at our sport um, and the ability to go into a marketplace, really grow the sport, uh, we want to make sure we have all the levers in place to not just kind of come in and out. We want to build NASCAR within that particular country or marketplace. Um, and as we continue to talk in Montreal, we realize that you know, probably a little quick uh, to be able to make that happen. And in the meantime, there's been a number of discussions, not only in other areas in the U.S., um, but other opportunities in North America and outside the U.S. So for us, it was a little bit of a pause, and let's evaluate all of those opportunities together um, and you know, look at what's in the best interest of all of our fans um, for 25 and beyond to make sure that we put the most exciting schedule together possible. Okay. Next, we'll go to Kelly, and then Lee, and then Nate. Kelly Crandall, Racer.com. I, I guess this would be for OD as a competition question. Uh, Steve, there's been times this year where there's been some issues with the officiating in the tower, some inconsistencies. Brad or Elton has admitted that on SiriusXM a few times. This offseason, is there going to be some time to review or just take some steps to try to button up what's been going on in the tower to not have as many of those issues? So I, I would take a little bit of issue with as many of those issues. I think as a sport, um, I'd put our officials up against any sport in the world. Um, and I'd also put our officials from an integrity standpoint up against anyone in the world. When they make a mistake, they don't hide. They go to the media, they go to a race team, and they correct it. Uh, doesn't happen in all sports. So do we want to get everything right? We do. Uh, but I would remind everyone there's no timeouts. There's no going back to New York to review something. You're, you're racing, and every second of every race, you got to make a call. And you got to be able to defend that. So what I'm proud of our folks is they're able to come in and defend the call they made. And if we made a mistake, we're going to address it. Uh, we meet every Tuesday. We go over everything that happened in race control. Uh, we talk to the drivers. We talk to the owners. So we want to be perfect for sure, Kelly, but uh, we're not going to get everything right. Uh, we're not going to get everything right in 24 or 25 as well. Um, but I promise you that the best interests of getting it right every single second of every race, it's always our goal. Okay, we have Lee next. Lee Spencer, CatchFence.com. Uh, to follow up on Bob's question with the short track package, are you, OD, would you be um, up to just having something other than a one size fits all type of car to improve the product on the short tracks and the road courses and if that meant a different engine package in that car or different aerodynamic parameters of for that car um, is that something that NASCAR would entertain yeah I think that's one of the things you saw with the test you know looking at the the underbody of the car if there's certain areas we could remove on short tracks and road courses that would make an improvement we, we would absolutely do that okay we'll go Nate Claire, and then Jeff. Uh, Nate Ryan, NBC Sports. Not sure which Steve would answer this, but my question is about Fontana. Yeah, probably that, Steve. Uh, we've recently seen visual evidence floating around that the demolition of the two-mile oval in Fontana has begun. Can you confirm that? And can you also provide an update on if the plan is still to put a short track there, if the parameters of that layout would still be like a Richmond, Bristol, Martinsville hybrid, and when would, if that's going to happen, what's the target for a completion date and opening? So I like the three-part question, Nate, but at least they're all together, right? <laughs> um, a, common, a, common, a common thread, right? Um, so I will take this one. I would say, yes, I will confirm that demolition has, has begun. Um, I would say that we are still planning on building a short track uh, in Fontana. Um, what the timing of that, I don't know. There's, you know. This isn't the best time to be building based on you know inflation, the cost of capital, et cetera. Um, but our intention is to continue to be in, this, in the Southern California market. That for 2024 will be at the Coliseum. So, but it is our intention to build a short track uh, in, the in, the, in the Inland Empire. I think, it, yeah, it's gonna be a short track. It'll be most likely be a half mile racetrack what exactly that looks like but you know we've got renderings we've got what it looks like that you know we are we are ready to go when the time is right i do um that's a good question um that we're not ready to talk about nate because we're not going to talk about the 25 schedule steve alluded to a couple of things that we could potentially look at but the southern california market is important to us okay 
We'll go to Claire, then Jeff, and then Jenna. Claire B. Lang, Sirius XM NASCAR Radio. I talk a lot with fans on the radio, and it seems to me even the fans who are iconic longtime fans are understanding change now and are embracing it more than I recall them doing. What is your feedback saying about that? And then also, can you also talk about how the drivers can help sell the sport more than they are now and what you're envisioning that they could do that they're not doing, you know? <laughs> yeah, go ahead and take that. Um, <laughs> so, um, no, I'm just kidding. It's his birthday. We'll be nice. Um, let me start. Uh, let me start with the latter, Claire. So I think that what can drivers do? I think as we look forward uh, in 24, 25, and beyond, um, and this was a, a question that Jenna asked last year with respect to quote driver star power, right? I think for us, we are. Um, We've got very, our drivers are fantastic. They're interesting. They're, you know, heroes when they get into the race car. We need to ex expose them in a greater way to both existing fans and nurturing that relationship with their existing fans and future fans. How do you do that? Well, one of the reasons, one of the ways we can do that is we have a brand new production facility that we're building out in Concord next to our R&D facility, which will have two main components to it will be kind of the live broadcast component of it, and then something we call NASCAR Studios, which essentially is content. So we think the opportunity to create content, interesting content, whether it's short form or series, like you know what we're doing with Netflix or whatever that may be, to serve fans where they are is an important component to it. Because we've got, our drivers are, you know, they're cool, they're interesting. Um, and we think we've got the best racing in the world. So though all those combinations together, we think will allow our drivers to build their own brands. If we build our driver brands, then the sport's gonna have the best success for, for long-term long -term growth. And your first question with respect to the racing, is that what it was, Claire? Fans, the f understanding change that they used to yeah, I think, I think that's fair. Claire, so I think for every Chicago street race um, that we've done, you you juxtapose that with North Wilkesboro and the All-Star Race. I would say those two events were fairly signif significant events, but very different from each other. So 80% of the people who bought a ticket to the Chicago street race had never been to a, a NASCAR race in their life. I would suggest that if you went to North Wilkesboro, you probably had a number that was like 80 people had never been to a NASCAR race. It's a very different animal. That's okay. And why wouldn't we want to do that? And you think of that short track in the hills in, in North Wilkesboro or Wilkes County and you know a major metro downtown in Chicago, I think that's a cool thing. So yes, I listen to your show often and it is, you hear race fans talking about that. Hey, maybe Chicago street race wasn't everyone's cup of tea but it was interesting after we announced Chicago, the number of, with our research, the number of fans that said, oh, that was a whole lot better than I thought it was or it would be, um, that's an important thing too. So we're trying to serve over our 38 weekends across three national series, all kinds of opportunities for fans to, to be engaged in our sport. Um, and I think that we do a better job than most sports, honestly, listening to our race fans what's important to them, and how do we serve them, because um, it's important to us. I would, I would just add one thing that I think you know, we really want to focus on going forward, too, with our, with our broadcast partners and others, is just how hard this sport really is. And I think for some of the new fans coming in, there's not a lot of difference between our, our quote-unquote fans who have been with us for a long time and new fans. But when someone's talking about Kyle Larson and he's able to hit his mark, you know, what does that mean? Um, you know, and if Kyle Larson gets out here on Sunday and is able to hit a spot that's an inch wide on a racetrack, lap after lap, that's hard. And showcasing that and why he's so talented, why he's different from other drivers is going to be really important for us going forward. I think, you know, that's an opportunity for us to really showcase the skill that's involved on any form of racetrack, as, as Steve talked about. But particularly on ovals and what happens uh, is going to be an important area for us to focus on going forward. All right. Thank you. So Jeff's next. Jenna, followed by Deb. Jeff Gluck from The Athletic. Um, 
you just talked about driver star power a little bit, and I was wondering because you know the industry lately has had sort of a conversation around this topic of whose responsibility it is to build this. And you talked about you know NASCAR Studios and Netflix and what you guys are doing. Um, where where does the responsibility come from? Like, is it are, are you supposed to be building this and driving this? Are the team supposed to be doing it? Are the drivers supposed to be doing it themselves? How who who is is lacking in that area, and and what needs to happen to make that better? Listen, I think we all need, the answer is yes. Um, all the responsibility is with NASCAR. The responsibility is with our race teams. The responsibility is with our drivers. Um, and I don't. Um, I think that as we move forward, putting things in place that will allow for the success there is important because we will not optimize our growth if the entire industry doesn't come together. Um, and I include racetracks in that too, which is why I included that in my upfront. It's important to grow driver brands. And listen, I've heard from, you know, from others that, uh, from the race team saying, hey, we want to build our, our own brands as, as race teams. I'm for that too. Um, if Hendrick Motorsports can build Hendrick Motorsports and it leads to more engagement from our race fans, I love that. Um, but I do know that drivers becoming more popular, increasing driver star power, is absolutely going to grow the sport as well. And so we need to make sure that we're putting things in place that will allow that to happen. Okay. Jenna, Deb, and then Chris. Jenna Fryer, AP. Thank you, Steve O'D, for spending part of your birthday with us. No, it was a gr yeah, it was great. Um, shockingly, I, I, like I'm stuck here. I was going to ask you about star power, but I think that you're just going to answer the same way. Um, so I, I'm going to try, though. Um, yesterday, unprompted, Blaney said to us, he said, unfortunately for you guys, there's just no drama. There's just no excitement. It's just uh, the four of us. There's no bad blood. And then Dale Jr., I think the phrase he says is these four guys are just not very dynamic and aggressive. How do you overcome that? Uh, you know, how, how do, you know I, I know you've been talking about the energy on site is good at events, but it, you know, when you've got the, own, the, the participants and the people here saying, yeah, all right, these four could have been more dynamic, but this is who we're stuck with. How do you overcome that? Oh, you get it. No, I, I guess I would say, what does that mean? Uh, you've got arguably two of the best race car drivers in the world uh, going out to compete for a championship. So I, I'm a little bit confused. I'd, I'd say you've heard from Kyle Larson and Christopher Bell in terms of the U.S., what they're doing on different surfaces. You've got Ryan Blaney, who's gone out there and won. I'd say it's pretty dynamic in terms of, I don't know if you spent, I think you have some time with Ryan Blaney. He's a pretty fun guy. Um, and you look at, you know, William Byron, you know, what he's done, what he stands for. So, you know, everyone's not going to be, you know, a certain personality that drives things. I think we've got to look at, you know, what they do to represent our sport. I'm, I'm proud of those four drivers and what they do to represent our sport. I think going back to what Steve said, you know, there's, there's things that we've got to do as a sport to really showcase their talent more on the racetrack, right? And, and I think that'll help us. You know, we're not going to be a soap opera. Um, we're, we're a sport that's going to go out there and race and showcase the talent um, of our athletes. And with that will come personality. With that will come some storytelling. We've got to do a better job certainly around storytelling. But I, I personally, I think I can speak for Steve on this, I'm, I'm proud of the final four we have in, in all, all, all of our series. Um, you know, certainly some people do some things differently, right, and, and outside of a race car. Um, but that's for us, I think, as a sport, and, and you know, you asked the right question, and, and we've talked about it. it's on everybody, race teams, the tracks, what we're doing at track to showcase our drivers. Candidly, going back a little bit old school, um, you know, some of the things we used to have with stages at tracks, you know, autograph sessions, things we may have gotten away from in the past that I think getting the drivers with their helmets off, getting that personality out there a little bit more, um, I'd reverse it a little bit, Jen. I think we have a big opportunity as a sport because we've got a crop of young drivers for fans to come in and embrace. And now we've got to do the job, as do they, uh, to say, hey, come root for me, right, uh, and come along for the ride because it's a lot of young drivers that we need to have fans embrace and, and latch onto and show them why. No, and I think that's an important component as well that Steve brings up about the young drivers. I mean, the average age of our, our championship four on the cup side is 28. The oldest driver is 31. You, got, you will have either a two-time champion in Kyle Larson or a first-time champion in the other three. And 
I will go back to my opening. I think these guys, if you get here and you're the championship four, you deserved it. In all, in, honestly, in all, in all four, uh, three series, national series. And I'm excited about what we're going to see on the racetrack Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I think there's going to be incredible drama. I don't, uh, I don't think that any of those four drivers uh, in any of the four series is just going to lay over and let someone win. They're not going to. They put the helmets on, they strap in, and it's game on. And that's what they do, and they do it better than anyone in the world. All right, next we'll go to Deb, and then Knight, and Wolfgang. Deb Williams, Auto Week. Having covered this sport for four decades and having seen how much good NASCAR's diversity program has done in the last two decades, how is the... America First legal complaints to the EEOC going to affect NASCAR's diversity program? You know, Deb, I'm, I'm proud of the work that we've done in, in the areas of um, diversity and inclusion to, to broaden our sport. Our sport's about welcoming all race fans, right? And that's what we want to do. We are going to continue efforts to have the entire country, the entire world come to our facilities watch on television, um, because it's a, it's a battle love for racing. I think our racing and our sport in general, but racing specifically, is a great opportunity for people to come together. And that's what we wanna do. So we're gonna continue to, to make sure that we are broadening um, our fan base and broadening our fan base across every segment of this population, young, old, black, white, um, male, female, all of it, um, because that's how we're going to grow. Our job when we wake up in the morning, how can we grow this sport? And we're going to do it with all kinds of programs to meet potential race fans where they are or existing race fans where they are. And I think that's a responsibility of anyone who works within this sport, certainly those that work at NASCAR. Thank you. All right. Chris, Wolfgang, and then Jerry Jordan. Nightcatchlines.com. Uh, this question is for OD. We saw that NASCAR brought stage breaks back to the road courses at the Charlotte Roval in October, and I was just curious if that uh, motion was going to continue into 2024 and we see stage breaks get back on the road courses. Yeah, first of all, good to see you back here, Niter. Um, I would say that uh, we are strongly looking at that. I would say 99% there will be some type of stage break, but we do want to look at the incentives during the race. Um, there was a lot of challenges from the race teams, the strategy and you know who stays out or points. And I think we want to take some time with the teams and drivers to figure out you know, what's the best use of that. Uh, maybe looking at the point system uh, as well, but would anticipate stages for sure. Okay, Wolfgang, Jerry, and then Utter. Uh, Wolfgang Monza from Germany, Ranchport Press Agency. Steve, a question for Steve O'Donnell. Uh, if I understood you correctly, you said earlier there is a possibility that NASCAR leaves the American continent to race somewhere else in a foreign country. If so, this required a cooperation with the FIA over in Paris. Can you tell me how is the cooperation with the FIA, especially on the safety side of construction of race cars, including NASCAR Cup cars? Yeah, I would say, first of all, um, really proud of what we've done in North America in terms of safety and, and working with the FIA. But, you know, we go through ACUS. Um, we have good, great, great cooperation uh, between NASCAR and IndyCar and, and all of the forms of motorsports in the U.S. I think you're seeing some of the technology we've actually come up with be utilized now um, in other forms of racing, which is which is terrific to see. So. Uh, for us, it'll be a delicate balance depending on where we go. Uh, closer relationships um, with certain uh, FIA leaders in specific countries and some we've got to get to know. Um, so we'll continue to look at um, what forms of racing we would bring outside the U.S., what technology is under the hood. A lot of opportunities for us as a sport, be it you know, alternative fuels, electric, hydrogen, um, everything's on the table. Uh, which is unique uh, for, I think, us as a, as a sanctioning body in terms of, you know, having that Garage 56 program, having our next-gen car designed specifically for all kinds uh, of different power units. So we're excited about the opportunities uh, and can vary those depending on where we're at, country or continent. All right, next we'll go to Jerry, 
And then Jim. Jerry Jordan, kicking the tires. Uh, Od, for you, um, a year or so ago, there was a lot of talk about EV cars, and then that kind of shelved. But uh, my understanding is you guys have made some great strides in that department. Can you elaborate on, confirm what uh, what what's going on there? Yeah, a lot of work's gone on at the uh, R&D department around EV. Uh, we have a, a car. We have an alternative body style with that car. Um, I would not look for us specifically to go racing with it. I think you could see it showcased at certain events next year. Um, but there's other forms that we want to look at. I'm actually headed to Japan Thursday um, to go look at hydrogen racing specifically. So we've got a contingent heading over to Japan to look at that. So we want to kind of test each and every form. Um, really excited about what our teams put together around uh, an electric car, but again, wanted to just showcase that to the fans and then explore other technologies as well. And a quick follow up for uh, either one of y'all, because y'all both addressed it in the past, but uh, in 2017, you guys said there's increasing excitement around NASCAR. Uh, we continue to have ongoing dialogue with a number of auto manufacturers about their interest in joining the sport. Where do we stand with OEMs so many years later now? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a question that, that we keep getting, rightly so. Um, there is certainly interest. Uh, I think the, one of the reasons we went over with Garage 56 was to continue to spur that interest. And the challenge remains for us, you know, what engine package are we going to be running specifically around Cup? So the good news is all of our existing OEs are very open to dialogue now about where the new technologies are going. And I think as, as everybody here reads about the auto industry, it's, it's in flux, right? There's a lot of technologies being looked at. Uh, things change almost monthly in terms of, of what's going to be uh, in the hands of consumers. So we need to get that right. I think the dialogue that we're having now with our OEs is allowing us to have those conversations uh, with potential new partners. Uh, it's part of the trip that when we go over to Japan to, to look at that, it was part of the trip when we went to Le Mans to have conversations with new OEs. And I think it will be important, as Steve talked about earlier, with the, with the charter discussions, you know, as we look at our team owners to be able to, you know, seed a new OEM or, or two with our, with our, uh, our car owners as well and, and bring some new interest into the sport. So it remains a goal. All right. We'll take our last question from Jim. Jim Mutter, Motorsport.com. Uh, birthday steve earlier you said about um the effort of not wanting to be a soap opera and more that we're a professional racing organization but i wondered in a world which uh, sadly seems to gravitate towards soap opera uh, it, whether it be media entities or just what people like to talk about how difficult is the balance to stay relevant when you want to want when you want to rely on the competition on the track, but there may be another element of society that gravitates towards the drama and the and the other stuff. Yeah, I think it's a great question, um, and it's something that that we look at. We want to do both, and I, and I don't mean be a soap opera. I mean we need to tell those off track stories of, of who our drivers are, who our race teams are, what goes into the sport. Um, but then when they're tuning in on the weekend, we want to continue that storyline. We want to have a great product on the track. We want both of those to kind of marry up so that if there's interest in a specific driver or a specific team, um, make sure that we're delivering um, across all platforms. So we're able to tell the story. We're able to deliver that week in and week out on the racetrack and, and build that momentum throughout the season. So it's going to be important for us to do both um, in a smart way that relates to not only our existing fans but potential new fans. Um, and that's around the schedule, what you see on track, and then telling the stories um, that go on from you know Monday through Friday as well. All right. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for being with us today. Steve, any parting words? Uh, <laughs> we didn't practice this part. Uh, all I would say is, um, again, appreciate you all being here. Um, I think we're, as I said, we're going to have a great race, uh, ARCA race this afternoon. Um, the race this evening, uh, it just, you know, it's the culmination of um, what started back in February, um, and here we stand somehow, somehow we're at our championship race, so we're excited about what that looks like. Oh, wow, mood lighting. Uh, I'm not sure we're, we're going to start dancing or what, <laughs> the club, bottle service, what's going on? Um, at any rate, so thank you, um, <laughs> thank you for leaning against the, the lights. Um, but again, want to um, want to say thank you to uh, to each and every one of you for what you do for our sport. So thanks.